Thunder, 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 Thunder Geeks are live! Welcome Thunder Bay, this is CILU Radio 102.7 FM. Warrior Thunder Geeks, and that was Everything is Awesome, covered by Kirby Crackle. I'm Andrew. I'm Megan. I'm Rob. And we'll be your Thunder Geeks for the evening. We're so happy to see you guys. Um, we're so pumped to do this show for with you. Uh, we're just going to do a little bit of intro for us. So, I mean, uh, Megan, first, fire off. Favorite movie? My favorite movie would probably have to be Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. For those who don't know, and I don't think there's that many, what is Scott Pilgrim vs. The World? Scott Pilgrim vs. The World was a comic book based movie where uh, it takes place in Canada, actually. So that's really cool about that. Um, it's about this guy who um, is, falls in love with a girl and turns out that she comes with a few um, pieces of baggage. Baggage, yes. <laughs> she comes with some baggage and he has to, like, literally fight to get her heart. The Seven Evil Exes. Rob! Favorite I, movie? I gotta say Mallrats just because it's the ultimate depiction of my life. Ratting at the mall? Yup. So, for those who don't know, what is Mallrats about? It's about two dudes, T.S. and Brody, who simultaneously get dumped, and they decide the best way to alleviate their pain is to go to the mall and do nothing. Sounds like a fun time. And I'm Andrew. My favorite movie happens to be The ABCs of Death. It's a bit of an obscure horror movie that's been gaining a lot more traction lately. The concept behind it is they take 26 different directors from around the world, each give them a letter of the alphabet and 2500 bucks, and say, make a movie about death that starts with this letter. Now, that doesn't sound interesting to begin with. However, they also have the Japanese directors, Korean directors and Norwegian directors and every weird thing that you can think that that might come up with, the answer is yes. I don't try to explain this movie or justify this movie, I can just say it's an experience. So we're going to kick right into our talks tonight. There's been uh, something going around the web here, I found on the Thunder Bay uh, Geeks uh, Facebook page, but it's been all over. The game Hatred, my god the reaction to this is just visceral. We're going to be a bit of a clip here. Just be aware there is some vulgar language within it, so be prepared for that. My name is not important. What is important is what I'm going to do. I just fucking hate this world and these human worms feasting on its carcass. My whole life is just cold, bitter hatred. And I always wanted to die violently. This is the time of vengeance, and no life is worth saving. And I will put in the grave as many as I can. It's time for me to kill. And it's time for me to die. My genocide crusade begins here. First, so, wait, first of all, let me just say that anybody who was tuning in before, like, they, anyone who was tuning in during the playing of that and they didn't hear anything before, like, what you said about the warning, I feel really bad for you. Sorry about that. <laughs> the, it is a bit of a controversial game right now. It hasn't come out. We just released the, uh, the gameplay trailer. Uh, Megan, what's your reaction to it? Um, it's it's obviously like from the audio you can hear it's very violent. I mean, it's it's a good trailer. I mean, really good. Um, it just reminds me of Postal and like a mix and manhunt kind of. Um, it's it's really, it's pretty gory. Like I don't know. Wrong. I really I really like it, but. It... Well, my thing is people get bent out of shape because of this stuff because one in like a billion people will flip out and imitate what they've seen because they're psychologically unstable. And they blame the video games instead of going, hmm, maybe we should have, like, checked the unstable kid before giving him an extremely violent video game. 
And that's been one of the big things, and we've seen that argument retread a lot, and I was hoping it was long and dead, but the, the worry that's being trotted out is that that this isn't like Postal and Grand Theft Auto that were more of a parody, that it's more like Manhunt, and that there's going to be a lot of imitation going on for this game. I gotta call shenanigans. I mean, I, I'm pretty... Uh, we've seen study after study. Violent behavior does not, uh, is not come from violent video games. Violent people may and experience violent media, but so does everybody else. <laughs> My biggest problem with this is the game looks boring. It seems like a 13-year-old boy's fantasy, which, I mean, is great because I love that sometimes, but this, it just seems as they're going style over substance. Definitely. I mean, when you think about it, everyone is so um, desensitized. Our generation is so desensitized to violence, you know, but, like, I would not show that to my, like, five-year-old niece. Obviously, she would probably think that that's okay, but you know what? Like Rob said, it's all about the person, not the game. Yeah, and all you have to do is, like, I've been playing violent video games for as long as I can remember, and my parents never gave two hoots about it because they know I'm psychologically stable. I'm not going to go out on a killing spree. I'm not going to, like punch someone because I saw it in Mortal Kombat or some other video game. And that's where I think, you know, a lot of it lies with the parents because I know a lot of cases where they buy, like, parents will buy their 12-year-old child, you know, GTA and it specifically says on the front of the case that it is, you know, the ESRB rating is right there and it's rated M for mature. Is a 12-year-old child mature? No. I don't think so. In most cases, yeah, and I would agree that it really does come up to the ERC, ESRB ratings and that they're not taught enough about. Um, and a, a lot of the arguments seem to be re retreads of you know what we used to experience with Jack Thompson where it was this game, I mean they censored Manhunt 2 for this reason saying that because you're going into the heart of a, of a killer here that it's going to be influencing people. And the big thing that I have not seen talked about you know it's that you know does this game look any good and I don't think it really does. Um, whoa, 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 hold up there. It does look good. I you mean, think it looks good. I I think like it's it's mediocre. Like it's not it's not like oh crisis engine yeah whoa, blah, so beautiful, but it's it's decent. It looks like how I play Grand Theft Auto. I never play the story in Grand Theft Auto. I just get the guns, get the tanks, and killing spree. It does have a similarity to the early Grand Theft Auto games. I can see that where it has that top down shooter view, and it seems to be scrolling in just for you know it's actually a kill porn. Where you're just seeing those, you know, those slow gory kills. But for, for me, eh, it seems like it's edgy for edgy's sake. I gotta see more of this game to really know where they're coming for. Yeah, but for like, let's say a casual gamer who's not like into the story, into anything, just wants to pick up a game and like kill Let some... some steam? Yeah, and then that, that happens a lot. I mean, that's, that's why I play uh, my first person shooters. I want to blow off some steam at the end of the day. I just want to shoot people in the head sometime, but not actual people. And, and that's why I think this game is just a little more violent. You know, get creative with the kills. Like uh, like Andrew said earlier, I think he's just this this uh, game is just pushing the bar. Let's see let's see how far we can push this. And you know, like like Andrew said, it's a uh, shock. Let's see how much shock and stuff we can raise out of these people. And I mean, that, that's a big thing too. I mean, what were most of the Saw movies or Hostel other than just torture porn? And you, you don't see these argument for those movies. You didn't say, oh, this murder happened because of Saw. You see it focusing on the new scapegoat that is video games. I, I will say this though, the first Saw was not torture porn. There were only like three deaths and it was a great movie. I gotta say that in it's, its defense. Two to seven, yeah, that was just torture porn. But one was a legitimately good movie. The Saw movies were all really good, actually. For me, I, I have to admit <laughs> myself here, I have not seen any of the Saw movies. I love <gasps> horror movies. I love them to death. The problem with the Saw movies is that I have... I have a lot of empathetic pain where I see a ring through someone's, you know, Achilles tendon, it tingles back there, and I'm like, ooh, That's no. what I'm saying. Just watch the first one. The first one, there's only three deaths, and they're not that gory. But, but how, it still but, scares me. But how strange is that, that, you know... Andrew, you'll watch a movie of someone getting tortured, but if you see it in a video game, do you have the same reaction? Not as much, but I don't think that it has the... It doesn't have the same feel to it, because usually when it's happening in a video game, it's more interactive, 
where if it, the most you usually see with torture, um, granted, it could it's kind of different with the manhunt games, is that essentially you're just going in for the kill. And I feel like maybe when we play video games, even though it has a human form, we just take the humanization and the humanity away from but those, it, it, those, those pixels, you know? But, I mean, I, I, I say that with Saw, but, I mean, I can watch something like, you know, any slasher film, and it, it's the same reaction where it's just me enjoying the experience of watching, a, you know, something, you know, a violent movie and just getting those human fears and emotions out. I feel like... I feel like a lot of um, controversy is raised around, you know, video games and, um, like, anime, for example. The Death Note. You know, some people, they found a Death Note and, you know, like, a fake Death Note. And some, it has, like, written in it. Like, oh, I don't like that girl that sits in front of me in class. Meh, I don't write her name in my Death Note. Meh. And they make a, the media makes such a big deal out of it. But when a movie comes out, you where's the hype for that? You, you don't see this. I mean, we used to. We used to see that, but it just seems that, you know, it, you know we, it was rock and roll, then it was comic books, then it was violent movies, and now it's video games' turn. People always want to find that scapegoat instead of just admitting, you know what, I'm just weird and twisted, and I like this stuff, and I'm a killer, and why can't they just blame the person who did it instead of trying to have empathy for a killer fundamentally? Thank you, Rob. Thank you. That is a very good point. I, I agree entirely. I mean, it's it's something that we see a lot with... I mean, it's something that's easy for the media to pick up, and I think that's happening again with hatred. Um, as much as I'm lukewarm to the game, I think that... I mean, it's obvious that this was their marketing angle. They wanted to shock people, because that was, that was how they were going to get their game noticed, and it's worked. People are talking about this game all over, and they're horrified, and I'm pretty sure that's the reaction you, they want. You can really tell just, just from listening to it, what, what the tone of the game really is. However, I, I just don't see why this argument's being trod out again and again and again after it was put to rest for a long time. I mean, with Grand Theft Auto V, we didn't see the controversy this time where people are like, oh, Grand Theft Auto V is now going to cause more school shootings. Well, I think the reason with Grand Theft Auto V is because it is five. And people are like, well, if we do a new story about this, it's just repetitive. Let's pick a different game title to seem edgy and new. Yeah. Um, so let, let's move, uh, move on. So I think that's all we got out of Hatred. Uh, but, you know, tell us what you think on our Facebook page, uh, uh, facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak. Uh, so next topic on the, uh, the thing here is... Uh, so, they're possibly Robin's going to be in uh, Batman vs. Superman, but there's a twist. It's not going to be Dick Grayson. Apparently, they're bringing in Carrie Kelly. And where is it? Oh, yes. Yay, yeah. yay, yay, yay. Yay, female Robin, yeah? For those of you who are not aware, Carrie Kelly is the Robin in uh, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. It's one of the seminal works of comic books. Uh, along with Watchmen, it's really considered one of the... Uh, one of the stories that helped bring comic books into adulthood and into maturity. And what we'll see with that is Carrie Kelly was, um, oh, let's tell the story of The Dark Knight Returns. The Dark Knight Returns is Batman has been retired for decades after a tragic incident of the death of Jason Todd, which interestingly enough, that story happened before the actual death of uh, Jason Todd. But uh, Batman decides to come back to fight the mutants, and one of the admirers, Carrie Kelly, decides to don a Robin suit and ends up becoming his Robin. And we've seen a lot of, uh, just from what we've seen from Batman vs. Superman so far, they're really pulling from The Dark Knight Returns because the costume is straight out of the pages. Uh, they have the bat armor, and now it seems they have Carrie Kelly. However, we have a lot of people bringing up the female angle again saying, oh, no, it's not Dick Grayson. They, they don't even know there's a female Robin, but uh, how, how do you feel about Kelly Kelly? Well, honestly, I like that there are so many different variations of Robin. I really do like that because, you know what, there's so many different Batmans, too, I think. I'm, no I'm not I'm not 100% sure about that. But I do like that there's multiple different Robins because, you know, everyone wants to, like, hang out with Bruce Wayne, right? That's true, but there's only been one Bruce Wayne, but what I think you mean is throughout the years, there's different ways to interpret Batman, because in the 60s and 70s, it was that fun-loving, campy Batman, <laughs> and in the 90s, you get that dark, grungy Batman. 
But now it's more or less you get that nice healthy balance where it's like he seems a little more real even though his educational background is kind of head scratching at how one can have six master's degrees and master every single martial art. But who I, has I, time for that? Yeah. I don't I don't know. I don't I don't even have time to go to the gym after class. God. <laughs> the the answer of who has time for that is a multi billionaire who is driven <laughs> by the murder of his parents. However, uh, there actually have been three Batmans in the history of Batman. Ooh. There is the, uh, the obvious Bruce Wayne there was in the 90s, during the Nightfall Saga, uh, uh, John Paul Valley, who went up because... It wasn't Anarchy, uh, who was it in God? Arkham... Can't remember. <laughs> but John Paul Valley uh, ends up becoming... I'm going to remember it like about 3 a.m. in the morning here. Uh, but there was also one of my favorite Batman runs, Dick Grayson. So there have been three Batmans throughout the history. It's back to being Bruce Wayne. Not no. If you count like the whole Dick Grayson being Batman, you gotta remember the battle for the cowl where Jason Todd also donned the cowl to be the Batman for just a little bit. He was though. That's true. And technicality, there were four Batmans. You beat me. Your your nerd uh, trivia wins again. You know who my favorite Batman is? Batman. Alfred. Alfred Pennyworth. He's my favorite Batman. I don't think Alfred counts. However, I mean... He did uh, punch out Superman. He did punch out Superman. What? 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 In the Injustice comics, he takes a super pill to buy super, to buy Batman some time, and Alfred punches out Superman. Okay, Alfred is now officially my favorite DC character of all time. Now, 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 which Alfred? Because there's also been a few incarnations of Alfred as well. Um, it's all Alfred to me, I'm sorry. Oh, it's uh, all to me, Alfred is um like this immortal being, okay? So whatever. <laughs> but um that's not the only female superhero that's popped up. Uh one of the previous controversies and I believe the one of the first issues have come out now is Thor has changed. Now Thor has now become a female and there's been a lot of questions around, you know, what the decision on this is. Uh Rob ended to bring me around. I used to be a, I used to be a doubter. I'm like it seems like they're pandering, and I mean, I am all for diversity. I want more diversity in comic books, and Marvel, for the most part, has done it right. My biggest worry, typically, is, is that they're looking to pander to a demographic rather than tell a story, and then they end up losing all of the character traits that should come with this out of it. Now, Rob, how was... How was our new female Thor? Tell us about it. Well, actually, she hasn't been fully introduced yet. The first issue is only explaining why she's Thor. And that is because people don't know, but it's Mjolnir's uh, hammer says it's... Meow meow. Meow meow. Whoever uh, this hammer deems worthy shall wield the power of Thor. So Thor is still Thor, but the new person is wielding the power of Thor. Because Thor himself, Thor Odinson, is no longer worthy of the power. How did, how did Thor lose the power? Um, I can't remember which comic was in, but essentially what happens is Nick Fury picks up the hammer, whispers something to it. What he's whispered is not known yet. Oh. And after that, Mjolnir will not respond to Thor. It won't even respond to uh, Odin himself. Oh. I bet Nick Fury just picked up the hammer and was like, I saw Thor eat a burrito off the floor. And then the hammer was like, oh, gross, Thor, why would you do that? <laughs> that would be a great twist. <laughs> but what happens after is uh, Mjolnir's on the moon and all the Asgardians are like trying to lift it and it's not working for anyone. And at the very end, um, I can't remember if they announced who it was. They might have announced it in like a previous uh, like prequel to this, mm -hmm. but I didn't see it, so sorry. And this woman picks up Mjolnir, and she's fully armored by the end, and that's how it ends. It's just You don't know much about this new woman yet, because they're just explaining why she's able to be Thor. Yeah, and I know that was one of the big worries, that people were also worried on the flip side, that it was just going to be male Thor as a girl. However, other people have wielded the hammer before, and that's one of the things that swayed me, was Beta Ray Bill, also, back in rather the 70s or 80s, uh, became the wielder of Mjolnir, and... He also has his own hammer now, but they, this isn't the first time that Thor has changed. It's really disappointing because earlier today I was scrolling through Facebook. I have no idea where I was. Oh, I was just wandering, and I saw this photo, and it was a girl cosplaying as Thor. And it's like, oh, Thor has a sister. Her name is, and it's spelled W-H-O-R. And it's like, oh, come on. Aww. I was like, I bet she could kick your butt any day. And then now that this just turns up, that I'm like, ha, in your face. 
Well, part, part of the worry is, is for every thing they do right, there's a lot of times where they'll update a character and or they'll introduce a new character and and they have them... Uh, it's, we've especially seen with DC. DC is my favorite. However, they've been very, very They clumsy. cannot write minorities or ethnic groups because I'm going to go on a little tangent here, but Fire a few away. months ago, they released a uh, Arab Green Lantern, Simon Bass. Yes. And I love this idea. It's like, cool, you got a, uh, an Arab Green Lantern. You have an opportunity to do something with him. He's in three issues, and then he just becomes a background character who's occasionally mentioned. Hmm. Whereas Marvel introduced a new Miss Marvel, who is an Arab teenage fangirl, no less, who actually loves all the superheroes in her world, and she ships them and writes fan fiction. <laughs> yeah, it's act. But the thing is, what they do that I love is they don't write her like an Arab girl. They write her like an average teenage girl who just happens to be Arab, which is how it should be written. The fact that she's Arab should be an afterthought, not the like, we are forcing this down your throat. She is this religion. And I mean, the part part of the thing is I want the character's traits to inform their character. And that, that was one of my problems when DC introduced Bunker. That Bunker, I mean, part of the issue was uh, the writer they had on the book at the time, Scott Lobdell, who I'm unfortunately not a fan of. Uh, there's nothing unfortunate about that. There's nothing unfortunate about that. Scott lobdell has been uh, the surrounding of some uh, controversies before, most no uh, notably the Starfire controversy in Red Hood and the Outlaws. Uh, but when he introduced Bunker, who Bunker is a uh, gay Latino uh, character they introduced, and at first I was so excited, I'm like, this character seems cool. He's happy, he's fabulous, he's purple, and that's where his character ended for the entire run of that series, and you never got more. Part of the issue was writing a team book and that he just didn't develop it, but you, you saw it with, another, with the other team, with Robinson on Earth 2, um, Alan Scott was introduced as gay, and I almost cried in the issue where they kill off his fiance right after the proposal, and they, they actually make a more a better symbolism for the ring by turning the engagement ring that he, prop uh, that he was proposed with into his Green Lantern ring. You know what, though? It doesn't really matter, like, what goes on with a character. If you change one little thing, let's say, let's say the Green Lantern decides that he doesn't want to wear his ring on the middle finger anymore, everyone is going to lose it. You know what I mean? It's, like, simple little things, you know? It doesn't even matter, like, it, it could be from, like, the simplest little thing to a big controversy, like, oh my god, ah, female Robin, what? It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Somebody is gonna go and lose their lose it. So. But that's the sign of good writing. If you actually do have people so invested that something like that would annoy certain people, then that means you are actually gain people invested in the story. You got them interested. Like I remember reading Walking Dead, mm -hmm. and I actually yelled at my comic because they killed off one of my favorite characters, and it wasn't like in poor taste. It was just like, I remember screaming words I'd rather not say on the radio, but. That's the sign of investment when you actually care about the characters, care about the details. I remember uh, there was a plot twist, or it wasn't a plot twist. It was just part of the plot in um, Army of Two, the the last one, the third one that nobody played because they said it sucked and they hated it. But whatever, I liked it. Anyways, there was a there was a part of the plot, and I just remember just yelling like, "No, why? Why would you do that at the at the TV?" And it's like, ah, you know what? If you invest enough of your time, you're gonna freak. And I mean, I, I understand that as well. Um, and that, that's something every, that's something, it's true. Every time they decide to try to update or change a character, there always is that pushback. Um, sometimes it has worked out great. I mean, some of my favorite uh, reimaginings uh, were uh, Miles, the Miles Morales Ultimate Comics Spider-Man. I loved that story. Or uh, my, f my favorite Batman is in fact not Bruce Wayne. Uh, which shocks a lot of people. My favorite Batman was Grant Morrison's run where we had Dick Grayson as Batman and Bruce Wayne's son, uh, Damien, as Robin. Because it's flipped the character dynamic where we have this happy Batman and an angry Robin and it ended up working a lot better. Um, but I mean, and there was always that, there was that, there was the controversy at first, but then you see the book, you see the writing. And I think that's one thing I'm, a lot of people are worried about that I'm typically worried about that they have to prove me wrong first. Oh, I understand that. Like when, um, DC did their new story with, uh, the Joker pretty much cutting off his face. The edgy I, Joker. I was honestly worried. It's like, how are you going to make him funny without his face? But then I read Death of the Family 
and it actually gave me nightmares. It was so legitimately good. No, no. <laughs> when they revealed, because um, I read the monthly issues, so when they revealed at the end of the panel, uh, Joker with the face being held on with a belt, beating Alfred with a crowbar. Oh, oh no, oh. Alfred, I, why? I actually gave a little into the like while I was reading and I didn't sleep that well that night because I was worried Joker would burst in through my door and beat me with a crowbar. <laughs> oh, Scott Snyder got threats for that because he they everyone thought he killed Alfred and I mean even I was like no no I no. was convinced there are a lot of characters you are allowed to kill you are not allowed to kill Alfred. I actually had a running theory going that because the title was called Death of the Family I was convinced that they were going to kill off one character and I'm like well they won't kill off Damian Wayne like this yet. Well, no, and, he he still had time to develop. Yeah, obviously. so I was thinking, it's like, who are they going to kill off? And I thought, well, Alfred really hasn't done that much in the relaunch, so maybe Alfred. And I, that was my theory, going that oh, they're going to kill off Alfred. That's a, it, it's a dark twist, but it, yeah. Actually, there, there is news about Damon, but we're going to get that after the break. You're listening to 102.7 CILU uh, LU Radio. Uh, we'll be back. Geeks, and we are back from our little, little, tiny break with more awesome nerd news and stuff. So, so uh, I want to talk about the other big news about Robin. Robin being, again, one of my favorite characters here. Specifically, Damian Wayne seems to be coming back. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the story of Damian Wayne, St Damian Wayne is the son of uh, Bruce Wayne and Talia Al Ghul. Uh, now, Damien was actually killed, la I believe it was last year, in, uh, uh, it was Batman Inc. number 8. Um, to qu and it would always been the plan to kill off uh, Damien Wayne. Originally, Grant Morrison planned to kill him off within four issues. But this character gained such traction, he realized, I have so much potential to tell a story with this character. He ended up keeping him around to the point where he became the permanent Roman under Dick Grayson. Now... So what happened at uh, the end of Batman Inc. number 8 is that in the background, and this was not revealed until Grant Morrison actually pointed it out, the graves of Damian Wayne and Talia Al Ghul were empty. So some interesting developments have happened in the comic book world here. What is happening with Damian Wayne, Rob? Well, first his body was taken by Raj Al Ghul to be re reincarnated in the Lazarus Pit, but then... It wound up being Darkseid, stole the corpse, and took it to Apocalypse. And now Batman is going all cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, trying to get his son's body back to give him a proper burial. Well, I can only imagine. I mean, Batman lost his parents, which drove him to be a, uh, you know, a superhero to begin with, like a vigilante. Like, I can only imagine how much he would lose it. Like, I'm surprised he's not turning into the Joker right now, you know? Oh, he's gone a little cuckoo, because um, in order to go into Apocalypse, he's got this super armor that the Justice League helped him build in case the Justice League turned. And he wants to take said armor and bust into Apocalypse, which is fundamentally comic book hell. And take his son's body back and the Justice League is like dude this is like a suicide mission for a body this sounds really close to like you know Hercules when he has to like break into the underworld and take Megara's body out of the river Styx you know I hadn't even thought of that no. <laughs> wow <laughs> well they do say that comic book heroes are the modern Greek myth of course um, and it's, it's one of the things that I've loved all my uh, for most of my life here I'm just shocked. I was taken aback by that insight because if that was the uh, the intention of Tomasi, that's just you know awesome storytelling. However, however, we might be getting Damien back. However, there has been some rumors that they might be introducing a different Robin. There's been a few others in the loop, but uh, they're being very coy. Uh, but keeping on the superhero bandwagon this week, um, DC uh, actually announced their their movie lineup for t up until 2020, and it's pretty impressive here. So we're getting Batman vs. Superman in 2016, as well as the Suicide Squad movie. Then we have the Wonder Woman solo movie in 2017. Then we finally get Justice League as well in 2017. And let's not forget Aquaman. Aquaman's coming. Aquaman's in 2018 along with The Flash. And one of the uh, interesting things that they have confirmed now is that they will not be crossing over the uh, movie-verse with the television series universe. They're going to keep them separate, so it is not going to be the same actor. Um, yeah, the Aquaman movie's coming as well. We have the actor uh, Jason Momoa from Game of Thrones, and I, I am pumped for the Aquaman movie. I have always been a huge champion of Aquaman. Um, there's Shazam that's coming in 2019, Justice League Part 2 in 2019, 
Cyborg in 2020, and then Green Lantern in 2020. So let's go down the list and see see our predictions for these movies. Now we talked a little bit about Batman vs Superman, but I'm worried because I'm not really a fan of Zack Snyder's movies. Um, Man of Steel. I, I didn't feel it uh, as much as I wanted to love this movie and I tried so hard at the end I think it was if you if you take the Superman myth out of it separated for all the changes they made I think it's a badly told story it seems like three movies they match together and giving him the reins to what will be the linchpin Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice I'm worried if they bomb this it's gonna kibosh the whole thing however however I'm more. I am totally on board for Batfleck. <laughs> uh-uh. That that's a great term, and I can I I half agree with you. I'm I think Ben Affleck's going to be a good Batman. I'm curious how he's going to be as Bruce Wayne. I I would think he'd be a natural Bruce Wayne. I mean, that's one of the things that he's always accused of that he's kind of a snobbish, suave, uh, you know, playboy. And that he seems above everyone. That's the Bruce Wayne persona. I'm so for for me, it's I think I think he will be great because Ben Affleck is a fan of Batman. And I can just imagine like during production, if he did something wrong, Kevin Smith picks up the phone. What do you think you're doing? That's not how Batman's supposed to be. Actually, as the story goes, they haven't talked in a long time. They, no bad blood between them it just they kind of fell they fell apart but that's one of the reasons we know that bat uh, ben affleck is a huge batman fan he sold kevin smith his old house but in that house he built the entrance to the 1966 bat cave to his panic room so it's a bookcase that opens up and that kind of dedication i i i, I gotta give him props and also we saw what he can do with argo i think he's going to be good for the film but what what but I'm st- my, my main worry is the director. What are you thinking, Megan? Um, first of all, it's about time DC got their you know head together and trying trying to catch up with Marvel because Marvel's been putting out so many movies recently. I mean, it's about time DC started to catch up with them. However, I don't know. I don't feel like Ben Affleck would be the greatest Batman ever because Batman's you know when I think of Gotham, I think of like New York, obviously. Um, and Batman, Ben Affleck is Boston. He's got he got the accent. I can't do a Boston <laughs> accent to save my life, apparently. <laughs> Anyways, and it just, it would be jarring. I feel like it would just be jarring. Because, like, you know, when I think of Ben, Aff- ben Affleck, I think of, like, Gili with, like, J-Lo and or, stuff. Or Good Will Hunting. But one other thing I, I must throw in there. People hated the idea of Michael Keaton as Batman. Yes. And he is the Batman to me. Like, no one outdoes Keaton. Wait, wait, which one was he from again? He was a Tim Burton Batman. Oh, yes, okay. That was my favorite Batman. And people sent in letters protesting, don't make Michael Keaton Batman. He can't be Batman. But he was such a good Batman, though. He was. that's the thing. We knew afterwards. uh, Because the only thing that people really knew Michael Keaton for from before was just, you know, comedies. He's like, oh, you're going to have Mr. Mom as Batman here. And Beetlejuice. And Beetlejuice. Oh, Beetlejuice is at least a little more creepy, but no one was expecting the performance we ended up getting out of. Because the thing is, we're all young. We didn't really experience the hype, so we're going from history here. No one thought Michael Keaton would work, and to, to me, to Rob, to Megan... Michael Keaton was our Batman. Now we're gonna more, much more than uh, than with the Christopher Nolan movies. I thought I thought that Christian Bale was the least Batman thing about them. Um, I feel Christian Bale was a very bland Batman. It was like it was like a two day old turkey sandwich. See, I think Christian Bale did okay as Bruce Wayne because when I saw yes. him as Bruce Wayne, it's like yeah, yes, he was I a good Bruce this. Wayne. But. The growly voice where it's like I'm Batman. <laughs> I'm Batman, and I've been smoking for forty years. Yeah, that was like my biggest complaint with how he portrayed Batman. Also, he had the dumb like his mouth was never closed when he wasn't talking. He just always looks like confused, scared, and lost. <laughs> no, no, like pause any scene where he's not talking, and he looks like mom. That's one thing I'm. Gonna... I need an adult. Yeah. That's one thing I'm gonna hope that they get right within the Batman versus Superman movie that they make Batman a detective because I think that's one of the things they have not done within the movies yet. The closest was in the 1966 Batman, but the the riddles they had were oh, ridiculous. Okay. I feel like that's Actually, Batman's superpower. Like if Batman did have a superpower, I would, it's his brains. It's his brains. It's his brain. It's and his that, brains. And because you brought up 1960s Batman, I have to tell the story now. 
Oh, oh God. Of you and Adam You're West. just showing off now. Hey, hey, hey. Name because dropper. it's our first show, I have to tell a story <laughs> at least once. Okay? okay, fire away, Rob. Go, go, go. So when I went to Fan Expo this year, one of the people I had to meet was Adam West. Of course. Who, for many of us, was our first Batman. And as I approach him and say hello and all that, he's like, you have an amazing voice. You should be in radio. And I just started giggling because, like, I knew I was going to be doing this soon. And he's like, can you do me one favor? Say this phrase. And I shall say for you, same bat time, same bat channel. And Yay. I fanboyed right after. <laughs> now, now, now. Um, where are we going oh, with wait, the... Wait, wait, one more Batman thing. One more Batman thing okay. before we move on. Um, the thing about Michael Keaton being Batman is um, a lot of the time comedic actors can play serious roles very well. You know, people say that Jim Carrey, who was the Riddler in that movie, right? It was a what? later no, movie. That, that, oh, that was oh, in the that was wait. Batman Forever with Joel <laughs> Schumacher. There, there's. I need to get my Batman timeline all fixed here. Okay, wait. Anyways, but Jim Carrey, who played the Riddler? Yes. He, I was actually a very serious. He played a serious role in um, nineteen number twenty three. Number twenty. Number twenty three. I was oh, thinking of a different movie. movie. There. Um. Anyways, he played a very good role in that movie, and nobody gives him credit for it, but he played a very serious role, and I think that's what Michael Keaton did very well as well. Well, one of the swings from from the uh, the reason that it swung so far into camp, I think that if they had Tim Burton directing it, granted that there are some issues with the planned third Tim Burton movie that I was worried about. I want to see the Superman movie. The Nicholas Cage. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get oh to that. no! 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 We'll get to that. <laughs> oh, no. However, however, uh, what what the plan? What, I think if they would have had Tim Burton uh, directing Jim Carrey, he would have been a more serious role. But because Batman Returns was so dark and got such kind of a it, it got lower returns because of a negative reaction that they decided to swing the camp all the way the other way. So far, so that we saw Batman and Robin come out that almost killed comic book movies. Bat uh, nipples. But, but, oh, no, God. The, the, I'm also glad it didn't happen with Tim Burton because they had cast Robin already to the point of locking him into the contract. They had to pay out this actor's contract to hire What's his Chris face? O'Donnell. Chris <laughs> O'Donnell. I don't think he's done anything much no. afterwards. But the actor they were going to cast was Marlon Wayans. Yes, that Marlon Wayans from the Wayans Bros. And I'm... I'm no. You can switch Harvey Dent because it's Billy D. Williams, and Billy D. Williams can do whatever he wants. I don't trust the acting chops actually, of Marlon Actually, Williams. I think Tim Burton saw the future because in the latest issue of Future's End of Batman and Robin, oh, we've got a black Robin. Oh. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, Beauty. It, See, it, I love years, all of the... It's five just, years later, but yeah. I love the rainbow that is Robin. I'm just I'm just putting it out there. So ne next movie the, uh, on the docket, Suicide Squad. Now I know I know there there's something about Sui I I know you roll up Suicide Squad, but they're missing something. Tell them about it, Rob. Okay, so from what I've heard is they're planning to make a Suicide Squad movie without Harley Quinn. And excuse me. Yeah. They no, they can't do that. And for me, I have two major reasons why. One, I'm a huge huge Harley fanboy, like to the point where I've got a Harley tattoo. But the second thing is. She is the most marketable character out of the whole Suicide Squad. And if you want the general audience, you have to have at least one character where people can go, I know who that is, and then walk in because of that fandom. And you'd think DC would... Well, I think DC knows that, but you'd think Warner Brothers would know that because with the Suicide Squad animated movie, they didn't... It was a Suicide Squad movie, but they didn't advertise it directly as a Suicide Squad movie. They had Batman in the title, and Batman plays a very, very side role in that movie. He's in eight minutes. I actually timed it. You actually... T eight minutes. Eight minutes of, uh, of the movie, we have Batman as the title character, but it's really a Suicide Squad movie. I hope this movie's gonna sell, um, but, I mean, without Harley Quinn, where can you really go you know what i'm really disappointed of the lack of harley quinn that there is in the movies of all the batman movies where is she why there are oh. jokers there all the time that's his like right hand girl. actually this is a funny thing anne hathaway when she was auditioning for dark knight rises thought she was auditioning for harley quinn because she thought the story would go harley's getting revenge because joker got put away which would have been a much better movie than i am justice i will fix yeah. I will break you, Batman. <laughs> we, we all pull out our I, banes, I, I our terrible bane accents. I can't do that one. I don't. I don't. I'm terrible at this. And I wanted to go to voice acting school. What was wrong with me? Actually, interesting enough, there was a plan to use Harley Quinn in the other third installment of a canceled Batman series. Of Joel Schumacher was going to get a third movie called Batman Triumphant. 
And the plan from it was is to bring in Harley Quinn, I believe, as Joker's daughter. They, 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 I mean, I'm whoa, whoa, that's yeah. too well adapted. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, no, no, they, they, they totally. It, it's a good thing it did not happen because that's, the plans they had for the movie were terrible on so many levels. Well, I mean, it's only recently that they've really caught on that people want an accurate representative, you know, accurate representation of the character. Um, I feel I, like I, got, I got to make this one note that. If any of you have ever seen the Batman anime series from '94, there is a great stab at Joel Schumacher in it, where oh. where three different boys are like envisioning how they see Batman, and one kid named Joel, wearing a feather boa, no less, is talking about how he imagines Batman as this huge, muscular, brewing man in latex, and all the other friends are like, "Shut up, Joel." Hey, 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 hey! I was down for the latex because even though George Clooney was a terrible Batman. He was still a sexy Batman. Now, I, don't, I don't understand. The latex is, doesn't protect you against no. bullets. Well, it, it's it, it's latex, but I mean, I'm guessing it's supposed to be some sort of. Futuristic it's like how empowering oh, they say it's, it's not spandex. It's super dense armor. There's actually this whole thing Batman in Power Rangers RPM where they actually go into like a 10 minute explanation of what the spandex actually are. Batman could wear fishnets and they would like repel bullets. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, we, we need, uh, if we have any people we, listening who do fan art, please do a picture of Batman in in, in like fishnets, please. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. I volunteer. Wait, wait. <laughs> I, I want Batman in Black Canary's costume. Oh yes. God, yes. I'll try. I'll try my best. Of like his like little hair. His like like hair poking out and everything. <laughs> so after Suicide Squad, we we have the movie that I'm most worried. I'm, mo- I'm both one of the most excited about and most worried about because there's been. A lot of different interpretations of the character. There have been really, they've revealed some details of it, but the Wonder Woman movie with uh, Gal Gadot. Now, I'm after seeing the costume, I'm sold. I mean, I don't care that her physique is smaller; it can still work. Uh, I know she's supposed to be a tall Amazon, but hey, we saw what Peter Jackson can do with the Lord of the Rings, making people three different sizes. I don't know if they'll go the same route. I'm not sure that it matters that much no. as long. She has the look. Movie magic, right? Movie magic. However, however, the one thing, is, as famous as Wonder Woman is, the one thing a lot of people don't talk about is uh, after you know the initial run of Wonder Woman with the original creator, a lot of Wonder Woman stories have been terrible. I mean, uh, uh, through a lot of her history, I mean, uh, until I think there was... There was... I, I think it's a simple problem of why. And this may sound like... I may be the wrong person to say this, but men shouldn't be writing Wonder Woman because... No, they really shouldn't because Wonder Woman is supposed to be for women. I, I would disagree. I mean, I shouldn't say supposed to be, but it's mostly targeted towards Wonder women. Woman was actually created by a man. He was oh, uh, I'm created not... by the, the, I know. I know. the lie detector. And my, my, fir- my favorite three runs would be the 2006 uh, run with Greg Rucka and the uh, after the new 52 relaunch. And that's actually one of the directions they're going in with Azarello. Um, the one thing they have announced about Wonder Woman is that they're going to keep the new 52 origin. For those who are unaware of uh, Wonder Woman's origin is that Wonder Woman was supposed to be the only daughter born to Hippolyta but was not born of a man. She went and prayed and uh, we, we had Diana Arroy arise from clay. However, what, it, uh, what the twist was when they relaunched in the new 52 was Hippolyta lied. That in fact... Wonder Woman is a demigod and was a secret affair of Zeus because it's... I... Oh, oh, we had the naughty button. So we're going to go again here. <laughs> so, what's your reaction to Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman is pretty awesome. <laughs> but my thing is, I, I like this little thing they hinted at in certain comics and stories where she's also lying about it being Zeus, where it's actually Hades who knocked boots. Whoa! Whoa, 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 I haven't read that far, so we had some spoilers here. <laughs> but, we don't know so, buttons. So, so it was Hades? Um, it's being hinted at, but it's not, like, confirmed. But I think that'd be much better, because then when Wonder Woman goes a little dark, you can go like, oh, I get why. Yeah, no, we have a lot of shiny buttons around. I see we, 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 we forgot to hit the mic buttons going into the break there. Okay, but uh, after after Wonder Woman, then we have Justice League Part One, um, also done by Zack Snyder. That's my biggest worry about, it. and also with they're gonna. I, I'm 
worried that they might throw too much in there because they own, they're only setting up Batman, Superman, and seemingly Wonder Woman beforehand. But you keep hearing these rumors of like, there's also going to be this character in the background, this character in the background, that character in the background, and it's, you never know who's going to be in there. Then we have The Flash. The Flash movie, my biggest worry about it is that the series is so good that it's going to end up weighing down the movie, that people are going to look at The Flash series, which has been outstanding, and go, I don't want to see that in a movie. I'm sorry, but didn't The Flash already have his own movie? No. no he the... had his own TV series in the 90s. Yes, oh, okay. yes. it was. Uh, that's actually where Mark Hamill came back as the trickster, and is the reason he got that role in the Batman animated series as the Joker and became one of the iconic the voices of The best Joker. Joker. The best Joker, yeah. The best I'll, Joker. I'll, I'll throw it out there. Uh, I know a lot of people love Heath Ledger. I know a lot of people love Cesar Romero. I know a lot of people love Jack Nicholson. But anytime I read Joker, I hear Mark Hamill. Oh, yeah, totally. And one of the things I actually like about Mark Hamill is that I love this little interview they do where he's like talking about his origin for the audition and he's driving his car in his LA and he's working on his Joker laugh and he's just driving, driving, hee <laughs> no, 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 Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. and people would just stare at him because he's giggling like a madman in his car. So the, the next up is a, a, the other risky bet. Um, I love Aquaman, but... Aquaman for the longest time has been kind of a joke. Now they they did address this with uh, the new Fifty Two relaunch, where they kind of played off that as part of his character that he really doesn't belong anywhere because on land, you know, the, he's the guy. In the, you know, fish hey, sticks, fish sticks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Aquaman, where's your orange shirt? Where Aquaman is, he's super strong. He's super fast. People, he punched out Superman. He does more than talk to fish. Yeah, he did punch out Superman. And actually, that's one of the things I'm going to slightly segue to. Instead of the Aquaman movie, is that they're making an animated feature based on the story for Throne of Atlantis. Throne of Atlantis, yeah, no. The, it's one of the stories that uh, got people into Aquaman, showing that this is a character that does work and you, you can take seriously. But, I mean, I, I bet there's... I mean, even Robot Chicken, you know, always, you know... Yeah, the, I, feel like, I feel like... Aquaman is kind of like the underdog. You the know, reason nobody they, really gives him any credit. Poor the guy. reason is because of one show, and it's the Super Friends, where they pretty much depict Aquaman as useless. Like a but if you watch the Justice League show and Justice League Unlimited from, uh, I think it was Bruce Timm's run. Yes. Oh my god, that Aquaman is amazing. He cuts off his own arm to save his son, and then he gets a cool harpoon. It's going to be interesting to see. That might be the way to go with uh, with Aquaman having the more rugged characters. I mean, they're casting Jason Momoa, and that's probably the biggest thing going for the movie because Game of Thrones is huge. People will show up because it has that actor in it. Also, I'm just trying to picture him as a blonde. Though, if, if I'm going... I don't think they're going to make him blonde. I'm not sure if they're going to go that route. Really? I, I don't even care about, like, Aquaman... Like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't care about how, like, people say, like, Aquaman is not scary. A- Aquaman is scary. Imagine... Him, like, throwing, like, an anglerfish at your face. Okay, <laughs> though, like, come on. No, but, like, another thing they like to compare is, like, think about how many PSI there are at the bottom of the ocean where he lives. And he just walks through that like it's nothing. Yeah, no, and that, that's what gives... He has nearly bulletproof skin. That That's something. Good point. And as I said, he however, punched out Superman. However, if I'm going to call it the best Aquaman, it's the outrageous one from Batman Brave and the Bold. Oh, yeah. You gotta love that, Aquaman. And Megan's just... I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with that Aquaman. To anyone who hasn't Aquaman. seen, Batman Brave and the Bold is based off the 70s silver age of Batman. So you got all that silly, goofy campiness, which is just lovable. But you get it with, like, with the modern twist, kind of. And Aquaman in that is what he was in the comics. That adventurous, loving seaman who's just like, for lack of a better word, outrageous. He is outrageous. Um, oh, Bat- yeah, Batman Brave and the Bold's probably... It's one of those series that a lot of people overlook because, like, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's a kiddie Batman. No, this is a love letter to the Silver Age. And it's not for kids because it's got a banned episode because the, the Birds, Birds of, of Prey make a song where they pretty much make euphemisms for every male superhero's gentelia. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring that song at some point in, in the coming weeks to see if we can find a good version of it and we can play it for you. So, then we have the next one, Shazam, which I'm probably excited because they had the perfect casting here. They cast The Rock. Dwayne The Rock Johnson as Black Adam. Dead on look. Dead on look. Uh, and Captain Marvel slash Shazam. I love the direction they took him with the new 52. I hope they keep that uh, origin where they have... A Billy Batson that makes sense because, I mean, I still love the Golly G. Willikers 10-year-old uh, Billy Batson and the contrast you have between, you know, him in adulthood and him as a child, but 
the the one that I really related to from like my own childhood was the one who's a little bit angrier. I mean, he's an orphan. It, it, he feels betrayed, and the the only you know real family he has now is one that he is you know uncomfortable with, and it it gave a more emotional story. I feel like it's about time Dwayne the Rock Johnson got his own superhero role. See, well, here's the thing: he's I, a villain, though. Yeah, he's the oh, bad guy. Well, hey, it's still, but but I wanted to him to be John Stewart. That. We'll we'll see we'll see because Green Lantern's at the end and they're pro- because it's in 2020 they're not going to link it to the Ryan no, Reynolds but... movie it's it's going to be rebooted so it'll be interesting to see if they go with John Stewart or um, maybe Kyle Rayner. However, um, my biggest question is, and it's been a question for a lot of people is the Cyborg movie. They DC pushes Cyborg a lot, but he's outside of the Teen Titans cartoon he hasn't been that popular of a character. Honestly, um, I was introduced to um, Cyborg for the Teen Titans. Through Teen Titans. Through Teen Titans, not Teen Titans Go. I mean... No, not Teen Titans Go. (laughs) The early 2000s version. Yes. Um, And I really, really liked his character. And there was was a part... There was a time... A timeline that they followed in the show that explained a lot about Cyborg and his origins a little bit. And I was like, oh, I really want to know more about this character because, you know, he had... Like a good storyline. I don't understand why he doesn't get more exposure. Because his junk is made of metal. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to kick. That, that'll be our kick to the break here. You guys are listening to CILU LU Radio on 102.7 FM. And we'll be back soon. Thunder Geeks. Thank you, Megan. So what a great time to be a geek here. Because, I mean, we, we ha- we're taking over television. And th- this is something I am so excited about. I mean... What other point in history did we have superheroes everywhere? And the comic book shows, they have raised the bar from what I can expect to come out. And I, I think, I'm hoping they have an influence on the movie and movies as well. So we have so many comic book shows that premiered within the past couple of weeks. Uh, first one I think we should talk about is one of the ones I was most excited about was Gotham. Now, Megan, you just watched Gotham. What was your, what was your opinion on it? I really, really liked it. Um, I really enjoy, like the um the batman series from different points of views you know because i don't like batman i don't like bruce wayne i'm sorry to say but he's not my favorite what i like about batman the universe is everyone else in it and i really enjoy that it follows uh commissioner gordon who was really it was really weird because the actor that portrays gordon i used to watch him in the oc all the time and i was like whoa wait a minute but he plays commissioner gordon very well. Well, he's not Commissioner Gordon yet. For those young, well, no, he's n- not yet. So, not yet. Well, but we know who but he, he is. is. Jim Gordon. Yes. He so, is. for those of you unfamiliar with Gotham, the story of Gotham is uh, this: is stars J- uh, James Gordon, or who will become Jim Gordon, oh, Commissioner Jim Gordon. Um, he has his part. It's set in a different Batman universe, so we can't compare it part per part. There's always going to be changes, and we can accept those, and we have to like them as they are. Uh, however, with Gotham, it opens up with the murder of eight-year-old Bruce Wayne's parents and James Gordon and his uh, partner, Harvey Bullock, starting to investigate it. And they are within the super corrupt Gotham, and James Gordon is your everyman within this crazy world of Gotham. Uh, Rob, what did you think of Gotham? I actually didn't like it. Oh. <gasps> we yeah, have, shock. Yeah, but we I, have a non-believer. But, Sean's a non-believer. <laughs> I, I love the Batman mythos greatly, but... To me, and I, I've got to get into the other episodes. I've only seen the first one so far, like Megan. I feel like it's way too much exposition. It's like, here's this person, here's this person, here's this person. Well, and it's like too many side characters being introduced at once. And I, I get it. you got to have them, but you don't have to introduce everyone right away. I think the reason why they did that was to get hype. Because, you know, people want to know that, you know, who's in it. If, if you show all the characters at once, everyone's going to be like, oh my god, so they're going to be in it, and people are going to be more likely to watch. But if, for me, it's like, okay, this was how I found out about it, because I don't have TV. I read comic books. Yes. And in most DC comics, there'll be that splash page in the middle where it says Gotham. And you can clearly see who's going to be in the show. So for me, it's like, you don't really necessarily have to force everyone in at once. I will say this, however. I was so worried about the child actor who'd be playing young Bruce Wayne, and he's good. I'll give him he credit. He does a really good job. He I does agree. do a good job. Um, I I have I am caught up with Gotham right now, and I was I was actually 
I wanted to love this show so much. However, I, I was weary. The, the The premiere episode didn't sell me because I had the same issue with Robert. It seemed like they were throwing a lot at the screen. However, there was one character who's been the standout character, I believe, so far. And as you keep watching, this is the character to watch the show for, and that's Oswald Cobblepot. I really, really liked him in the, in the first... I only watched the first episode, really. Um, he portrays... The actor, I don't know if he's wearing like a prosthetic. Oh, on it's his gotta nose, be a prosthetic. Or if he's just like born with that beak, but it is doing him very well. Oswald Cobblepot is the reason to follow the show because that um, that's what hooked me in. Uh, episode two, most interesting part is you know Oswald Cobblepot again. As they hit episode three, and that's usually what I give a show. Gotham starts hitting its stride. So I I, I am excited after seeing episode three and four where Gotham is going because you see. Because uh, at the end of uh, the premiere, we see Oswald is exiled for Gotham. He comes back, and then he starts making his moves. And what? I don't want to see Gotham. I want to see Rise of the Penguin, the TV <laughs> show. I was so upset with the ending of the pilot, because like I was just like, no, why would you? Why did you do that? Jim did it to save him because no, he's not no, a no, killer. No, what what Oswald, Oswald did. I was just like, why? Why would you do that to that poor man? He oh, was just, because, oh, he was because just you fishing. have not seen anywhere where he Oswald will go. Oswald has never had empathy. He will do whatever it takes to serve his own personal needs. And that's why he's such a threatening criminal. Because if you get in his way, he will cut you down. And he does. And I feel like this is going to like create a lot of like you know, weird, weird fetishes with the women's, you know, they're going to be like, oh my god, oh, Oswald is so cute in this movie and he's a psychopath. Oh, I am excited to see what Tumblr does with Oswald. Oh, Cobblepot. Tumblr is going to be great. Oh boy. <laughs> Prepare for the fan, fan art and the fan, fan fictions fan fiction. already. My favorite character from Gotham so far though, would have to be Edward Nigma. Is it Edward? Sorry, no. Yeah, it is Edward Nigma. Edward Nigma. Enigma. He's an enigma. Yes, um, he he did some some forensic things, and he he was introduced very briefly. He's Greg from I'm, CSI, essentially. Yes, yes. <laughs> I really enjoyed the like the, the one minute clip he was in. I was like, yay! We we do continue Fan to see it a little bit. We do continue to see Edward Enigma. There hasn't been much development with him. The the main uh, there, there's three main focuses we have. We have the original character Fish Mooney. I believe she's original. I don't recall her from any comics that I can remember. Um, she's an underling of Falcone. Uh, we have sort of a tangent with uh, Selena Kyle with Catwoman. Um, James Gordon, I was actually worried about at first because in the first episode he seemed kind of boring. However, as the series has been going on, being the average guy in a crazy world starts to work. And I think it takes till episode three where we really start to see okay, you think it's he's because grow a he's. He will eventually, I think that will, that will be their Smallville uh, Superman wears the suit finally moment. He never wore the suit. He didn't. He I, never wore the suit. No, no. In no, the he fin- never wore the suit. No, in the very last episode, he looks at the suit, he grabs the suit, and then they cut to, I think it was Lana reading the comic book. Oh. Yeah, and I gotta admit, was... I didn't finish Smallville. I, never, I thought they showed the suit. <laughs> I never I... watched Smallville because it was just too disappointing. And I'm not I'm not a Superman fan, I'm sorry. Neither am I, but like I watched the first few seasons, then it kind of got repetitive. Yeah. And then I decided to watch the final episode to see him in the suit. He wasn't in the suit. Well, I mean, okay, so but that that's my hope for the mustache. I hope Burns their mustache... Burns' suit. Okay, Burns' well, suit. Do a reveal with... Uh, well, it, it all depends, because they could always lead this show into being a Batman show. Um, but, I mean, I, I want I want the mustache to eventually come in, but I want them to save it for now. Oh, yeah. But I can just imagine it's like the first episode when he's starting to grow. It's like, what do you think? As he strokes his face with, like, the just bit of stubble where a mustache is. <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm, like, imagining, like, James Gordon with, like, a little rat stash, like, slowly coming in. Just, oh. like, it's just scraggly. If they, if they bring it in earlier, guaranteed they'll do it in a season break. I, I hope they just don't have it start growing all scraggly at first. I hope, have you ever seen that actor with a mustache? Has oh. anyone seen this actor with a mustache? That's one thing we have to ask, because we have no idea how he actually looks with a mustache yet. Wait, this this actor James James Gordon, yeah, because you saw oh. him. no, he never had a mustache in the OC. He was still like fresh face. He was always he had his he always had like his his face clean. So he what, never had a mustache. What if it's a mustache disaster? It could be. They might have to like do like a prosthetic mustache. Oh. Uh. <laughs> 
And I mean, I, I think the premiere was shaky, but I, I think it was a str- I think the only reason I see it is that is because of the bar we're seeing raised with the other book, oh, comic yeah. book shows. Uh, n- n- the next other big premiere recently is the season two of Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is, I think, a show that started out kind of weak. It took till half the season where the events of Captain America 2, spoiler alert, if you ha- it's out on Blu-ray and DVD. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch it. It's amazing. It's amazing. And you see what was happening in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. They, and what ends up happening is... Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I don't believe, became interesting until they dropped the bomb that HYDRA was still there, and HYDRA had infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. And we see one of the most boring characters that maybe not like the show, Garrett... Oh, no, it wasn't Garrett. It was... I uh, See, that's I'm how... Blanking on, that's how boring he was. I'm gonna... <laughs> again, 3 a.m., I'm just gonna wake up and say, that was his name. He just turns, randomly people listening to the 3 a.m. stuff, you just hear Andrew running... Click the mic. It was this guy. <laughs> However, he turns out to be Hydra. Ooh. Now, the uh, a part of the issue was for anyone if you pick up Agents of Shield, tough through that first half because it all seemed like filler episodes until until the twist of Captain America two drops and you go, I'm sorry, Whedon, for ever doubting you because every single episode mattered. Everything they brought up tied in to culminate into the and finale. The, and what happened to Coulson was like the feels. Well, Col- yes. Coulson is like the main character yeah. of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. See, I, I watched him in another show and he was a he was a father in that show. Like, he was the dad and I just I watched Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm like, he's the dad. He's <laughs> the dad of all of those agents. He he, wor- uh, he does work as a very father figure. Uh, and uh, for, for those of you who haven't seen Captain America 2 yet, at the end of Captain America 2, S.H.I.E.L.D. gets dissolved. But the show goes on. So what ends up happening is it picks up, Coulson becomes the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. I feel like a lot of people must have been afraid at the end of that movie. They were like, oh no, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is going to end. However, the bomb they dropped at the end of the first episode, again, watch the show, people, because if, if you haven't been watching it yet, we got to spoil it, because Whedon pulled a Whedon. Within the, the feels. The feels. Oh my god. The heart clench at the end of the episode. Um, Fits. I'm, ass- I'm assuming someone died. No, 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 it's actually much more depressing. It oh. is much more depressing. Oh no. We did not know. They left on a cliffhanger. Um, there was two of the lab techs uh, that were part of the team, Fitz and Simmons. They had been ejected by uh, the character who switched to Hydra. God, I gotta remember his name. <laughs> let's just call, let's just let's call, just call him. him Hydra Bob. Hydra Bob, Hydra Bob, so <laughs> C- secret agent Hydra Bob ejects them into the ocean, and they only have they, because they're engineers and they're super smart. They they end up rigging something to essentially let them get to the top, but only one of them will have air. The other's going to suffer, you know, might die or suffer a lot of damage. Oh, God. That's what happens at the end of the first episode. That's and awful. we don't know if he survived, if there was any damage or anything. So when we get so he seems okay all throughout the premiere of uh, the second season. Just until, stumbling with words every now and then. Stumbling with words every now and then, but then we get to the end. It turns out Simmons had left. He had been imagining her the entire time. Fitz has severe brain damage. To the depressing point where I was like misty eyed, like no. That almost brought me to tears. Oh, that's so sad. But oh, that's no. what's awesome about Whedon. And he is one of those writers who can get you so invested in characters, even characters you hate. <laughs> like I'm gonna go, like go back to some of old Whedon stuff. I hated Angel and Buffy, but when he did spin off Angel, I loved Angel. He was a great character. He did the same thing to Cordelia, who was one of the most hated characters in Buffy. But when he put her in Angel, he made her like so much better, and th- there were feels, many, many feels. Like, like I said, a- as I learned midway through Ages of Shield, we do not. I, I guess I got a Whedon fanboy. We do not doubt Whedon. No, 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 never doubt the Whedon. So, one of the other big comic book premieres was the Flash. Now, Megan, I know you haven't seen the Flash yet. I'm, I'm not gonna... a. I'm not a big fan of Flash. I'm sorry. That, I'm just not a DC know, person. I guess you know. I'm Wait, not no. a fan of Flash either. But I am a fan of Flash. I actually did like this show. And actually, going back to the movie thing, I thought of something. What if they make one of the, like, it's Barry who's the Flash in the show, right? What if they go Wally West? Or someone else, yeah. Or Bart Allen? or the, Oh, gee, I didn't even think of How that. How many Flashes have there been? Four. Four, and this this series follows which one? This, this, uh, this, 
It would be the modern... Well, there's been a few Flashes. With the reboot of the New 52, they went back to Barry Allen. He's technically the second Flash. However, he was the Flash was the birth of the Silver Age, um, where they essentially remade... The original Flash is kind of a completely different character that wasn't really related much in origin. Uh, they reinvented the entire character, and they came up with Barry Allen. That's the Flash we have within uh, the, the show. And I, I had to sell, sell this to a lot of people, because... Uh, with the Flash show, there's there's a lot of twists. I don't want this one's only two, uh, two episodes in, so I don't want to spoil this guy yet. But uh, it's actually I'm not a Flash fan. I'm actually invested and enjoying the show. I am a Flash fan, and one of the things they're doing is they're intentionally throwing us off um, because there's a character known as Zoom, and one thing that we can see already is that Zoom appears to oh, Professor Zoom, the reversed Flash. Uh, he appears to be responsible yeah, yeah, for that's the, his villain. The, the death of oh, what the origin of the Barry Allen Flash is uh, Barry Allen's mother was murdered when he was running home from school and it was pinned on his father and his father ended up going to jail and Barry is obsessed with clearing his father's name because he, he saw it was the man in the lightning but you have this little kid saying it was the man in the lightning that killed my mom not my dad and no one believes him until he gets these powers. The big thing about the Flash, and one of the things that makes him really unique, is he is a superhero that loves being a superhero. Not only that, but I will, I'm so excited for this show for another reason, is that it looks like they're actually not going the dark, brooding comic book route like they go with Arrow, but they're having the fun, cheesiness. Like There was one scene in the pilot episode that just made me squee with excitement, and when they're walking by the broken cage, you see a sign that reads only one word. Grodd. Gorilla Grodd is going to be a villain. I hope to God he will be. For those of you unfamiliar with Gorilla Grodd, Gorilla Grodd is one of Flash's many villains. He is a super intelligent gorilla. They are going full comic book with this show. And this is one of the things that really gives me hope. Um, and that, that, that they'll, start, they'll see. Because the Flash has had amazing ratings. And it has been unabashedly a comic book on the screen. They are not running away from the suit. They're not running away from the silliness of running around a tornado the other way. They are fully embracing all aspects of it. I think and that a lot of the series and movies out right now, they're like so dark. And like there was like this time in the 90s where every every comic book and every everything like that just went so dark. Because, you know, everyone was sick of like the buff, bam, kapowie, you know, but stuff then like we, that. We saw the swing the other way like we mentioned yes. earlier with Schumacher. Exactly. However, you got to find that nice balance between the camp and the seriousness. And I feel Flash is doing that. Which is perfect. But the show, as good as all of the other shows have been... And it was one of the ones that started off the shakiest. Uh, Arrow season three. Oh God. my God! This show uh, it started out kind of terrible. If I'm going to be honest, through the first half of the season, CW was stumbling around. It kind of came off as you know, a, you know, a campy CW drama with you know superheroes kind of thrown in, but not really. But the how it starts building the midpoint of season one, and by the end of season one, I was on board. Then they hit season two, and that's when the Arrow team learned, we're going to pull from the comic book, so they, they introduce the mask, they introduce trick arrows, and they start embracing it. Then season three, they knock down the door. The twist at the end of episode one of season three, they've had uh, the precursor character to Black Canary, because they've also run away from a lot of the, the powers here, where they had Sarah Lance, um who didn't have her Black Canary scream. They, she had a sonic device. She had a sonic device. It wasn't really used. She was kind of just, you know... A ninja with gr with great assets. <laughs> great, yes. But, 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 but... As good as everything else, I shed a tear when they hit this bomb on us at the end of, uh, end of the premiere of Arrow. Oh, I was they shocked. Kill, they kill off Sarah, and they're... Because for those of you who don't know... The, the original Black Canary is not Sarah Lance. It is Laurel Dina Lance, which is Sarah's sister. And she hasn't, she, she's actually been one of the characters a lot of people haven't liked. However, they're turning her around. I am so on board for this. And because they've introduced the, the uh, you know, metahumans with the Flash, which they're also going to be crossing over very, well, very soon. Well, actually, Slade was somewhat meta. Somewhat. They, they had the because of the superhuman. 
Which formula. is a cool thing because in the comics they do say he's a genetically enhanced assassin. And the other thing they brought in with the premiere, and they've been teasing it for a while, they bring in full-on Roy Harper as... Well, they haven't named him yet. They're still calling him Roy. I'm hoping for Arsenal. But they have him as an archer. He's in there. He's flipping. They have him as partners in a team. It is amazing. If there is any show that has... Ri- I feel that Arrow is so good that... The only reason I feel kind of shaky on Gotham is it's because, because Arrow's Arrow, that good. Arrow has raised the bar from what we can expect from comic book shows now. It hit the ground running in season two. It was great all throughout. Season three, it, it, Arrow has proven why it is the linchpin of the live action universe and why comic book shows can work. And I'm also excited to see Malcolm Merlin, a.k.a. John Berman, my... My future husband. Your future husband? My future <laughs> husband. I'm so excited to see him come back as the villain because he was great. I loved him as a hero in Doctor Who, but as a villain, he's so intimidating. Well, that's one of the things they've been teasing um, because when Sarah dies, she was shot by arrows. We do not know who shot them. There's been a lot of speculation about it. So it might be Malcolm. It might be uh, it might be uh, uh, Oliver Queen's sister, Thea who turned out to be the daughter of Malcolm Merlin. And one of the most interesting ones I've heard that I did not think of, what if it was the Huntress? No, no, no. Because if you watch the reaction, she knows who it is, and she's not scared. With Thea, you think got, it would be a I've, different reaction. I've With Malcolm, it would be a different reaction. No, here's my theory. Here's your theory. Raj. Raj? Raj would be interesting as well. Because they explain that she's got a thing for her daughter, and maybe Raj wants an heir, and if his daughter's going for another girl, it's like, sorry, I'll take you out of the picture. Well, I think we're going we're gonna to wrap up on that note. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. This is CILU 102.7 FM. We've been your Thunder Geeks. We'll be back next week at 1030. Find us online on our Facebook group, facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak.com. 